Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, for those who are new to seeing me, my name is Sheila Arnold Jones. Uh, are you on? Am I on? Are we doing? Okay, good. So, um, Sheila Arnold Jones. I am a professional storyteller and performer from Hampton, Virginia. This is where I live. And I travel all over the United States doing performances across the United States. Um, I am also internationally renowned, which is really not true, but I have told stories in three different countries and now people think I'm internationally renowned. So that's fine. Uh, it's, it, that'll work. That'll work for me. Um, this particular presentation is about the behind the scenes that happens with historic character presentations. Uh, most of you saw my other presentation. I know that you weren't there. I don't think you, you weren't there. And you'll, so you'll get to see a little bit of it. Some people will see a little bit of what I did before. I know you weren't there, sir. And so, right, I didn't see you there. And so we'll have, um, you will, and you weren't there to see the other pre the presentation I did. You saw the first one, but that has nothing to do with the second one. So, um, so uh, you will see a little bit of that at the, towards the end, but just a little bit, just enough of a taste. Um, historic character presentations, uh, the reasons that I do historic character presentations is because one, it is one of the best ways to teach history. Do you remember in school learning dates? Dates, 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 and on tests, the dates, and, and find the A, B, C, D of which one, which one of those dates it was. And that just is just hard, unless it's July 4th, 1776, <laughs> then we really don't really do that well with dates, you know? In January 1st, 1863, we might do a little bit better on that one, but, but, you know, but we really don't do as well with dates because dates don't mean anything to us unless they mean something to us. If I say 9-11, that means something to us. We've lived in that something. But even, I, I don't know the exact date of, of when uh, Martin Luther King died. When was it? Because you lived in it, okay? I didn't live in it. But that which we live in takes on, the date takes on something more. But when we're learning about it in school, the dates don't mean anything because they're foreign to us. What means something to us usually is the story that comes from history, the high story, the story behind it. And what's most fascinating about the story is, yeah, we do battles. And you know, you got those people that love a good battle. They'll talk about a battle all day long and, oh, yes, I understand, I understand. <laughs> and, 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 and when people come to me and talk about battles, I smile and I'm starting to think about my grocery list. You know, because I just don't get it. I can't, you know, I'm, a, I'm just having a hard time with them, you know, going left and going right and turning around and wheel this and wheel that. And, you know, and my dad is, is military. And, and so, you know, at one point in time, he had to, had to read about the Peloponnesian War. It was a thousand pages thick. I could not imagine having a conversation with anybody about the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> oh my gosh. But you know, that, that's a world in and of itself. And that, that is awesome because that is an important part of history. It's, it's a learning part. And military men learn from history in military battles. And they do. And they are very clear about learning from the battle. That didn't work. That's stupid for me to do that again because it didn't work last time. It was 500 years ago. It didn't work then. It's not going to work now. And they'll just tell you that. But the stories that get almost all of us are the stories of the people, the depth of the life of the people. The events are big too, but the events usually only become important through the people in the events. We completely understand the event of Bloody Sunday, crossing over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And that event is big, but John Lewis is bigger. <laughs> that concept of him, we just kind of go, oh, yeah. We, we, we stood up a little differently, because we understand that. That is the number one reason why I do historic character presentations. It helps people see history through the life of a person. And that's really important if I want to make people interested. Because unfortunately, probably not any of you all because you're right here with me, but a lot of people hated history because it was all dates. I hated it. Okay? <laughs> it was all dates and there wasn't the lives. So my job is to make history important. And why is it important for me to make history important? Because if it is not important to us as adults, we write it out of what is important for our children. 
we write it out of what's important for our children. In California, they no longer test for history. So guess what? You don't have to teach history because it's not tested. Virginia, that, that conversation came up in Virginia and people went, what? <laughs> Partly because it's our pocketbooks too, okay? <laughs> Understand, we got a lot of museums and a lot of history here. We do not want to be not teaching our students about history and then not paying to go to our history banks, okay? But, that, but, and I, but it's also important. It is important in Virginia. We've made that important, but it's not everywhere. What I want it to be is important. I also teach, I also use historic character presentations to drop little nuggets in people's mind. I am never to be the full course meal. I'm never to be the full course meal. I am to be the appetizer. I'm the one that makes you run down to the book, over to the library, go to 398.2 and find that book before anybody else goes and gets it, okay? <laughs> That is my job. I am not to answer every question. As a matter of fact, I ought to leave you with some questions that you have in your head. For Christine, I told Christine, now, you can't put me back to back like that because people are going to take time to listen to me. Okay. Then she walked in the room. Ah, you were right. You were right. They were like, you know, because there's lots of questions you have afterwards. If I've done it right, <clears throat> if I've done it right, it will just turn you on more to wanting to learn more. And then the other reason I present it is because I, I love the stories myself. And I want to be able to share these stories that I love. And I only share stories I love. I like to share stories that aren't known very well. Because I want people to know that even a forgotten life is an important life. Our kids get George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, I can't even name, you know, Yo-Yo Ma maybe. We don't do a good job of giving enough names of unknown people that still lived history and still stood up or did something. And I want students and I want adults to know that what they do even though it's small and may not be written big in a book, is important. That every step we make is history. So that's why I do what I do. Now, I'm going to use One Judge as my background, my, my conversation of, uh, of example for why I do some of what I do. I found One Judge when I went to Mount Vernon and at Mount Vernon went to the slave quarters and saw the tour there and went on the tour. They talked about her and I immediately ran to find out about her. So the bo first book that I got was uh, The Escape of One, J um, The Taking Liberty by Annie Ann Rinaldi. So fantastic book. She is a historical fiction writer, but in the back of the book, she does her research really well. In the back of the book, she put an author's note and then she had letters and parts of the will and all kinds of background stuff. And I was like, oh, love this. So this was the very first thing I read, historical fiction. Then the next thing I read um, was I went online to see if there was anything about her, there was a new thesis that had come out by a woman named Emily Arnold McCullough. Uh, Macaulay. I read her thesis and a year later she put out the book, a book of, of that. So I was able to do that. So there was some that was online. I got to find her articles online that were written about uh, One Judge. I found the um, I found the, uh, the, the, the advertisement that she had run away. So I could find some things online. It was not too hard to find at least something. But she was still a rather hard person. And finding all that was not all that I needed. Now, the first thing you need to know about me, if I'm going to do a presentation on a person, I have 12 different women in history I present. Let me go back even a step further. I am a historic character presenter. I am not an actress, although you will see me act, because I do not memorize a script. That's how you can do question and answer with me, because I don't memorize a script. I am not a reenactor. <laughs> Reenactors get right ticked off at me 
because I do not wear a proper reenactment outfit for the time period, nor will I ever. <laughs> so if I say I'm reenactor, reenactors really quickly will tell me and put me in my place. Well, you don't really have everything right. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I'm an historic character presenter and interpreter. I take the information. I read the information. I write an outline for myself. And I continue to keep researching all the time, all the time. And then I choose which parts to present. And then I also try to make it relate to today. That's that interpretive part. Everybody got me? Okay, so if you're like, is it exactly like, no, no, no. Do I use a lot of the words that she used? Yes. But is it exact? No. Okay. The other thing is, I don't start with adult books. I don't know if you've ever looked over at the adult fiction area, I mean biography area. They have big books, thick books, long books. There you go, I wasn't gonna say that. There are not as many pictures in those books. And when you read the books, they, they wanna tell you things. You know, I really don't care what kind of dog he grew up with in his house and why that dog is important to his rest of his life. I don't care to know everything that happened in St. Louis during the time Madam C.J. Walker, who's one of the people I portray, during the time that uh, she was in St. Louis. Every single thing that happened in St. Louis from the creations of St. Louis to the time, why do I need to know all that before I present? If I have to know all that information, I'll never do it. So I go to children's books. <laughs> because children have thinner biographies on their shelves <laughs> and autobiographies, they have pictures. I like pictures. They have timelines in the back. They're also written for children. And that's where I do most of my presentations. But you all don't know a difference, do you? Same presentation I gave everybody in here is the exact same presentation that I give to students. But I read them because they are better suited. It gives me the right words to use with kids. And they give me great information. I can plow through four children's books before I get half through an adult book. And that's where I can begin. So what I do, I read children's books. I read three to four first. I put the book aside, and books aside, and then I write down what was important to me. What sticks out? I just write it down. I write, 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 write until I finish writing. I just write down what was important to me. And then I know that those things that are important to me are definitely gonna be included. Because if it's important to me, then I can make it important to somebody else because I'll be excited about it. Then I go back and I look at the timeline and I pick out things that I need to make sure that I, you know, okay, oh, make sure you add that. I'll make sure you add that. Okay, very good. Then I go to the computer, to Google. Am I giving, you all okay with what I'm doing? Okay, so I go to the computer, to Google, and I Google timeline from date to date, from when that person was born to when the person died. And I go look at a national timeline, and then I fill in that person's timeline with all the things that are going on in their life. So I know who the presidents are for One Judge. I know when Nat Turner happened during One Judge's life. Uh, not during One Judge's life, but I know, um, yeah, yes, during One Judge's life, yes. Sorry, I gotta go back on there. And then, so I, I find out those little things that I can talk about. I may never talk about them, but I need to know they existed. And then I go and I look it over and I write an outline. I never write a script 
because as I continue to research, and I'm always continuing to research, I'm gonna add something or take something away. And if I have a script, it's much harder to add or take away. If I have an outline, I can go, oh, just move that there or change that there. Also, when I'm presenting, and if something happens in the middle of my presentation, I'm not worried about, did I miss a whole section of my script? Even the best of us as performers will forget parts of a script. And so with an outline, I can always move wherever I need to go. I can cover, I can go over complete chunks of it and go to a certain part because that seems to be more important at this time. And the last thing I do is I make a decision, what is the point that I want to leave with every person? Okay, for those of you who saw One Judge, what was my point I wanted to leave with you? The freedom is the freedom. Freedom is everything. I have kids. I have their adults now, some of them, some of them high school students. They'll meet me and they'll say, I saw you do that woman that told us freedom means everything. They might not even remember the woman's name. Matter of fact, I tell them, don't worry about my name. But they remember her point. I always find what, and I call it, what brick will I leave in the foundation for somebody that they can always take with them? That's very important to me. And every character I have has something. Madam C.J. Walker, I did her a couple days ago. <clears throat> she talks about service, that the money you collect is good only if you are able to give and serve the community that allows you to work in it. That was Madam C.J. Walker. Do we need that lesson today? Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean we, we seriously need lessons. So I find those lessons and I make sure I tell them. So that's how I begin to do that part of the research. And I continue on because first I have to look for, I try to look for primary source documents. Those were the things at that time period. Um, then I look for secondary source documents, things written about that person, things written about that time period. And then I look for all the tertiary things that I can. So I have these books on her, and then I have to go look at other stuff. So I want to see a little bit. This is called First Ladies. And it doesn't have anything fancy. It just has all the pictures of the First Ladies or the paintings of them. And it gives me an idea of what Martha would have looked like. Gives me some more information about Martha and gives me an idea because I need to have ideas of what people look like. It also gives me an idea of what people are wearing at different areas. Um, if you do something from the seventh, uh, ninth, uh, oh, well, one thing that has always been around or been around since the 15th, uh, 15th, 1500s have been etiquette books. And men have had books on clothing, magazines on clothing since the 1500s. Women didn't start magazines on clothing until the 1700s. Yeah. Men were really in love with themselves, okay? <laughs> Let's be clear. I mean, well, I'll tell you that in a little bit. But so, so you know, you can find, you can find literally magazines online uh, of, of different things that people were wearing at different times. Then I have to do things like, how did a person act? How, what was their station in life? How would they have acted? Well, one that's wonderful for us is that six, since the 1600s, we have had etiquette books written that tell you how to act. In the 18th century, the 1700s, there is a whole book. I saw it because it's in Williamsburg. A book that tells you one whole page how to stand and a description of showing the person standing. One whole page how to sit. One whole page how to walk for a man and then for a woman. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> it's a book. And it was a real book. So, I mean, you can, I mean, you can, so you have no excuse. You can learn how that person acted, what that person's time, you know, what their position was. And you do that. Sometimes when you're talking about African Americans, you're talking about Native Americans and the poor. There's not stuff written by them. So you have to go to stuff that's written by others that are similar to them. So you can get some idea of what's happening. Okay. Then how did they speak? 
Now, one judge speaks differently and children always go, but you don't sound the same. Here's my truth. I honestly don't know how any woman is going to sound until I open my mouth on the first day. And I've only ever changed one woman's voice. And that was Daisy Bates. Daisy Bates was the woman that worked with the Little Rock Nine during the, inter, uh, during the, um, the integration, desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And the only reason I changed her voice, because she has a little bit of Southern in her, the only reason I changed her voice is because on the day that I was asked to come and audition Daisy Bates for the Central Park, uh, Central High School, which is now a national museum as well. It's an operating high school, but it's part of the National Park Service. And they asked me if I would uh, come and present on Daisy Bates Day. On February 19th in Arkansas, it's Daisy Bates Day. And they asked me if I would come and present, but they needed to have an audition for me. And on the day of the audition, it just so happened that Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, Minnie Jean Brown was one of the Little Rock Nine, happened to be in town for that audition. I like doing dead people, because nobody knows them. Scared was not the word, okay? But I finished my presentation. Minnie Jean Brown said, that is marvelous. I hope you do her, except one thing, you change your voice. Your actual real voice is more like what she was. But that's the only time I've ever changed my voice. It's because of Minnie Jean Brown telling me to do that. And I'm very obedient to people who lived it. <laughs> um, on that same point, I don't try to pick people that look just like me. Most of you in here have seen that she looked nothing like me, Oney Judge. She was much more like this person, very light skin, light to being almost white, freckles on her face, curly hair, gray eyes, petite, ain't never been. <laughs> but I'm not an actress, I'm an interpreter. If I tell the story well enough, you'll never care. If I tell the story well enough, even if you've seen a picture, you'll never care. If I tell the story well enough, even if I'm over 300 years old, you'll think I'm really alive. <laughs> because I will have you suspend disbelief. That's my job to do it well enough that you forget that you're not in the presence of the person. So you believe that they're there, which means I have to really believe that's me. So you'll see me come into a, class, into a room. Mr. Joe had to help me. He was very kind. <laughs> he knew that I wasn't real, but he, he wasn't going to undo me right then. <laughs> and then he tried. He tried real hard. He said, so can you tell me how old you are? I said, you don't ask no woman how old you is. <laughs> Which is exactly what I tell the boys, because there's always one boy in every classroom that is usually nudged on by the girls that ask me thy name, and I go, boy, what's wrong with you? And they, oh Lord, it's just awful. They, they, they get beat up a little bit. But my job is to suspend disbelief. I don't have to look like the person, I have to be that person. That's my job. That's our job if we are to become and to act as other people in history, is to become that person for a little while and take all the things that we've learned and help people see the story. So I very rarely just start with, my name is such and such, I was born, and I never say I died. <laughs> You cannot die while you are talking. <laughs> I say that, you laugh. People do it. Yes, it is. I was born. And then at the end, they'll say, and then I died. And he's like, you are sitting up here in front of me. You have not died yet. And all the belief is gone. You understand what I'm saying? It's all gone. 
I, I got to do it from beginning to end. I have to be that person from the time I walk into a room until the time I leave. And I have to have enough other history that's around me so that I can con connect to people from other places. Children ask me the same questions. Did you know Harriet Tubman? <laughs> of course I didn't know Harriet Tubman. <laughs> didn't know anything about, I don't think I met her in ha New Hampshire, no. And they're like, oh, they're trying to put it all together. Cause they're just trying to figure out where history fits, yeah. you know? And, I, and I'm okay with that. You know, there's only one question you aren't allowed to ask me, that's how old I am. But that's a fussing question, okay? And then from there, I do do some acting techniques. So I practice my thing, and um, then I have to decide some, some techniques. Each of the women I do is at a different point in her own life. So um, Daisy Bates is going to be, um, she's much more proper. And so when I come in and the way I sit, I'm at the edge of my seat. My legs are properly crossed. Sometimes if I've had my puck book, I've put my pocketbook down. I sit very straight. You all ladies remember that time when that's what your mothers had us do. And if our feet were not crossed and they were properly here, correct? You sat kind of sideways. Yes, at least you're still doing it, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that's, but these were things that were taught to us. And so we, we have to find the right place. Now, when, when I come in and I'm on a judge, you'll see me with my legs a little bit apart, but I can do that because of the kind of outfit that I'm wearing that's all the way down. But she's a little bent over, and she's got to be that way. And even when she stands, she's just a little bit over so that she looks like she's old. If I have to represent a certain age, I will exaggerate that age. My mother saw Oney Judge when she was about 75 years old. And she went, that's the oldest 74 year old person I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I'm 75 and I'm not that old. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a reason I have to do that. And I have to do that because I have to get people in that mode. So one of the things that she does as an older person is she complains. It's a stereotype. We know not every old person complains, but we know enough that do. <laughs> that it's a stereotype. I feed right into those stereotypes when necessary to help me do the job of letting them suspend differently. I'm not doing it to make fun of old people. I'm not doing it to, you know, not for that reason at all. It is just to help suspend them. And I literally followed older people around. Not a very good idea, but I did and I did. I followed a man with palsy and I practiced the whole time and prayed he didn't turn around and hit me with the cane he had on, you know, and I, and I followed people. I, I watched how their mouth works. If you watch me and my mouth, will, my mouth will do all kinds of things. And, and I did it so well. One day a geriatric nurse came up to me. She said, I work every day and I was having a hard time, having a hard time remembering that this was an act because you had it down. She said, add one thing. I added one thing. So every now and then my hands will stop shaking and I'll go like this. She said, that's a way that somehow or another that works. Of, and you'll see older people say that sometimes. It kind of calms their hands down a little bit. But they hide their hands. They worry about spilling something on them. I purposely spill something every time. Because at that point, it's right at the point where the kids go, I've done the figuring. Martha Washington was a long time ago. <laughs> They're putting it all together. You can see it in their eyes. It's all coming together. This cannot be true. And that's when I spill my water. And I apologize. And I am profusely saddened. Those who didn't see me before will get the chance to see that. That is the moment they know I'm old because only an old person would be concerned about that and sad and they are kind. And it, the worst child in there is my kindest one. <laughs> so sweet. Um, Madam C.J. Walker, she comes from another time period. And she comes in and, well, she's got a little bit of a, she's a little sassy every now and then. 
And when she stands, she, she likes to wear her fur coats or her stole or whatever she has on. Because if a woman has a fur, they should wear a fur. <laughs> and she's fine. She sometimes talks real proper because she, she has somebody that's helping her with new words. Violet is helping her with new words. But then after a while, sometimes she lets it loose. Start talking about St. Louis and woo. Finger popping. <laughs> and the children like, finger popping? What's finger popping? And, you know, and I said, well, the blues was there, baby. And so she changes a little bit. And they go, oh, OK, they, they, they get a little bit of her personality. When I do um, Betsy Costner, Betsy Costner is a, uh, actually my family member, but also uh, tells a longer story of some other uh, primary source documents after, um, right before and then after the Civil War. Um, she's just learning what freedom is. So she's very uncomfortable in her skin. Um, she just got her last name. So she starts, my name is Betsy Costner. I has a last name now. <laughs> Y'all got last names. And it's her innocence and naivety that, that shows so much. And when I have a group of children that laugh about certain parts of her or aren't listening, I use that to my ability now. I don't know, I don't know how it is with y'all, but where I come from when somebody's talking, we all's quiet. Or I'm saying something that really puzzles children and they, I was like, well, I'm not trying to say that I know too much. I, I just learned a little bit. But it's the way I'd move my head that I'm just a little, un, little uncomfortable in front of everybody. And what does that make you all immediately do? You want to take care of me. You know, and if you didn't want to take care of me that moment, then you just have no feelings or emotions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then there's Zora Neale Hurston. Now, Zora Neale Hurston was born during the, during the uh, not born, but she was, she was big during the Harlem Renaissance. So I usually do her right after she's left Harlem and she's got some things going on. And she, she was a smoker and she was, she was bold. She would run up to people and, and she, they, she, heard, she read something that, something was said that Negroes' heads were smaller than, um, than, than, than white people's heads. So for a while there, she would run up to people on the streets of New York and measure their heads, all right? <laughs> She, she, she wore pants. Lord knows she wore pants and things. She was just bold. So usually when I come out, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm just waiting, you know. And if the person's introducing me and I'm like, oh, Lord have mercy. And I'm just sitting there and they're like, oh, Lord. And, and I'm totally in character because I'm just like, can she just shut up? You know, and I'm just like, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. And I'm like, I get up to the podium like, mm -hmm. That went on and on. I could have smoked a cigarette for that one. And uh, Lord have mercy. Did, did she just say smoke a cigarette in front of all them children? High school children. I tell the principals I'm going to say that, but they know. But that, that she was not one of those people that, and then, then she just gets to talking. And Lord knows, she just, well, amen. You get to hear a lot about her life. Mary Johnson's an older woman, and she's 1600s, and she's very proper. She does sit on the edge of a chair, but she is straight. She sits in the 18th century way. She always stands Oof. in the 18th century way. Proper. She speaks, but she rambles sometimes because she's a little older. And she only rambles about her children. But she has that persona. And then there was one more. Oh, Mary Peake. Mary Peake is, uh, she dies right before the Civil War, uh, right before the Emancipation Proclamation happened. She was a teacher in Hampton, Virginia. And it is where she taught under the Emancipation Oak, which is called Emancipation Oak now. Uh, she taught under the oak tree and over in the Brown House, which is a part of Hampton Institute at this, Hampton University now. And uh, so she comes in her outfit. She's a teacher. And every one of you, she would say, I've been asked to come here as a teacher and to show what my particular skills and how I teach a classroom of the new contraband slaves and their children. They have not had them. So I will just go ahead and teach the way that I know how to teach and hopefully your teachers can learn from me as well. All right, the first thing is sit up. Sit up in your seats. Feet to the ground. <laughs> Where are your hands supposed to be, young lady? On your legs. Yes, indeed. <laughs> 
Thank you, sir. Now, we will begin this. I always believe that your first impression is the most important impression. So the way you sit up, the way someone sees you, is the way that you will always be seen. Do you understand? Yes. yes. What did you say? Yes. Yes. Well done. Now, <laughs> <laughs> she whips those children into shape. You should see the looks on their faces. Just like y'all, they're like, what did our teachers bring to us? And I will, I mean, I whip them up and I'm like, sit up in your seats. They're like, she's she serious. And if you don't sit up, oh, I will call you out in a heartbeat. Young man, did you not hear me? Oh, yes, 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 what? Yes. And there'll be people going, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Because they are just, <laughs> There are some children that don't know yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. That's very true. And they, they, they and, I say, and I'll just look at them, yes, and there'll be somebody, and man, you just say yes, ma'am, just say yes, ma'am. And I, I make them sit up. They have to sit up in their seats the whole time. I make them, you know, I make them, I, if they start to slouch, I have them sit up because she was trying to teach these children that had never seen a book. They had never written a letter. Their parents couldn't help them when they got home. She had 50 children in her classroom, sitting on floors or outside in the dirt. Two or three slates was all that they had. She had to get them disciplined before anything else and let them know they were worth and worthy. So I do that with the students. I bring them on stage, they have to answer questions, and the whole bit, and I tell you afterwards, the kids just think it's the most wonderful thing in the pan, and the teachers are like, what did you just do? Because <laughs> the kids, what I've learned is that children actually want boundaries. And when they're given clear boundaries, they follow them. They'll buck a little bit, but if you keep the boundary, they'll do it. So I have to find, and I encourage whenever you do this, to find what your personality is. And then you have to get the right clothes. <laughs> All right, good. So now it's time for me to do my strip tease and just teasing, just teasing. <laughs> it's like, oh, it was going to get good, sound man, but not really. All right. So, uh, oh, and I'm always reading continual, I always read continual things. I try to read a little bit about um, whenever I'm getting ready for a program, I go back and review uh, what I've already learned and then add, you know, what, um, then finish reading a book or finish, you know, go back and answer questions. I have a list of questions for every single one of my women and one of the women. I just have tons of questions because every time I look at a little bit of the more literature, I, I have more questions. So I always have tons of questions to answer. And I spend time on the websites. I, you know, I try to go visit places. I've been to Madam C. G. Walker's um, last home, Villa Loero, over in uh, Irvington on the Hudson in New York. It's amazing. Um, uh, you know, I've been to Central High School. I, so I, I get to go to some of these places. I lived in and uh, worked in Williamsburg. So some of my Williamsburg people, they've been there. So I try to go to and add about these places often. But I ask myself a lot of questions because I, I want to remain curious. I don't want to stifle. And then I'm awful in a museum. I got to take a notepad with me because I'm always writing down something. Oh, add that, add that. And, and you know what? It always gets put in. So you all who are here for the first one, you got to hear about Arcadia today and the Arcadian people. I read that last night right before going to bed. And so you got, a, I was already going to do a Louisiana story, but then I had that extra information about Arcadia and I was like, I'm sharing it. <laughs> okay. And here's the weird thing about history nerds. History nerds, when we find a bit of history, we are going to share it with the first people we see. We do not care if it has nothing to do with anything else in the conversation. You just are the first most captive people we have. And so if you go to some place like Colonial Williamsburg or Mount Vernon or wherever you go, and you go, like, why did they tell me that piece of information? They had just researched it. And you were the first captive audience they had. And they wanted to get it out their system. So just, just, just smile and go, OK. <laughs> getting dressed clothes are real important you gotta go and find what people are wearing easy to do so this is my getting dressed part and um are, are you okay have i bored you yet no. you all right all right so these are stockings i'm just gonna tell you what i'm doing and putting them on you're gonna see a little bit of my legs uh don't look too hard all right <laughs> I'm assuming that's your wife over there, right? All right, so, well, she was forcing you around. I, I'm certain she's your wife. I am, so, whew. 
Oops, Lord, have mercy. And I'm getting old. Okay, and I'm already big, so it didn't, don't help. All right, so these are stockings. And stockings, uh, this is, uh, she's 18th century, early um, 18th century, so late 1700s and the early 1900s, early um, 1800s. And so stockings are worn by uh, everybody. Men and women are wearing stockings. Stockings come in a variety of colors, uh, how some ever. Uh, for most who are gentry, there are three levels of society during this time, the gentry, the middling sort, and the lower sort. The gentry are those who had money when they were born. They were born into money. They have land and money already. The middling sort are those who could be possibly born into money, but their family didn't automatically have money. Somebody had to work for that money at some point in time, uh, at least, you know, in their time period. So, and then the third one was uh, lower sort, that slaves, um, indigenous servants, um, poor, uh, poor whites, sailors. Are, uh, so everybody wore stockings, but you're, you only wore different color stockings if you were from um, the middling sort or lower sort. But if you were from the gentry, you wore primarily white stockings. That includes men. OK, we're going to understand a little bit more about why men are wearing these stockings as well. But men are definitely wearing stockings. It's awesome. Then you have the shoes. These shoes are from Colonial Williamsburg. I actually bought them in Colonial Williamsburg. They cost me more money than I ever want to spend on any costume ever, ever, ever. OK, and some of the things that you're going to see me do, and I'm going to encourage you to think about about trying to be a person in history. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. But but um, you don't have to have a perfect costume. OK, I do not wear reenactment costume on purpose. I am going into schools and I want teachers to do this. But teachers will stop themselves from doing it if they think that they only have to do it with the right proper costume. It will stop you if you think, oh, I have to have the right proper costume. So when I do this and I'm talking about it, I say, you get some long tube socks for your softball and you put them on your legs and you're good to go. And guess what? Nobody can, <laughs> unless they're a reenactor, and I put them in the back row. Okay. I said, I'm just saying. They, they come up to me afterwards, well, you know that. I said, I know, I know. All right, so these are the shoes. The shoes uh, in the 18th century were not made right and left. They were just made shoes. And so once you put them on your feet, you had them right or left, and you left a certain way to figure out, you know, which foot went on the right foot. I never figured that part out yet. And you'll see that I have ribbons on my shoes because I went to go purchase the buckles and they were even more costly, which they were during the 18th century as well. So I was like, oh my goodness, look at the cost of these buckles. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, you can be like the ladies were because they were expensive then too. Sometimes when the ladies could not afford, their husband could not afford buckles, they tied, they sewed on the inside. These are not sewed. I know they're safety pins. Okay, I've got it. Uh, but they used a ribbon and made these holes and used a ribbon. I said, really? He said, yes, we have documentation. That's all I need to hear. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, I just, I'm good to go. I, just, it, it doesn't take but a little bit of documentation for me sometimes. I do actually try to have documentation that is at least three different places I can see it. Unless I know somebody is an expert and then I trust them. You know, and then I, I could trust them because they actually worked on that. So these are the shoes, slight right and left. And, um, and these shoes are working shoes. They are also women's shoes. They're also men's shoes. They're shoes. Okay, these are pretty basic shoes. Now, gentlemen might sometimes have boots. All right, uh, those are very nice. Um, men sometimes, particularly gentry men, might have shoes that were uh, more dapper shoes. They might even have different colors. Uh, a man might be a macaroni. Mm -hmm. That's a man that likes to dress up. Yes, indeed. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. <laughs> and it stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. <laughs> macaroni was actually meant that you were a man that was a little bit proud of what you wear. And sometimes macaronis would put a little pink or paint a little pink or something like that on the back of their shoe. A pink or blue or like that. That was a macaroni kind of thing. Yes, yes. See, I know all kinds of stuff that you probably shouldn't even know about. All right. And so then we put on a shift. Now, if this shift happens to look like an inside out pink nightgown, it is because it is an inside out pink <laughs> nightgown. Okay. Again, I don't do this so that they say it's absolutely perfect. What I do is I want teachers to go, 
Oh, you mean I can just go to Dollar Store and get Yes! <laughs> yes, go to Dollar General and get that thing. All right, so this is a, but a shift, a shift was uh, either white, uh, or pre or white was only for gentry, um, but it could be off-white, it was all saying it's cotton, it's linen, and it goes down usually about to right here, about this part right there. Everybody, everybody at one point in their life is wearing a shift. When boys are born, they have shifts on. And they wear shifts until they are breached. That's when their daddy decides you are now going to be a, basically a man. You're a boy, but you're, you are no longer taken care of. Until you are breached, men, boys are always taken care of by their mothers. The moment you're breached, you're no longer your mother's child. You're your father's child. And what age was that? Five, six, seven sometimes. Sometimes depend on the age, you know, how the boy did. But you, once you got breached, you were no longer your mother's child. Now, that may not sound real like a big deal. It's a big deal. What that meant is if your father died and you were seven years old and you were breached, your mother did not have the right to raise you by herself. So if you did not marry soon, think Martha Washington her first husband, Custis, dies. She's married within a year and a half. If you're not married soon, they will take your son under the law and put your son with a family that can raise your son. A family that has a man. It means, words, we just don't think words sometimes, it, it means a lot. Because when you become your father's son, your father's child, it means you cannot be married by your mother by herself. That does not happen with girls at all. Girls always remain their mother's child. But it's a big deal for boys. You might even have heard that One judge says her son William was taken away at 10 years of age mm -hmm. to go apprentice on a ship. She never saw him again, but he was apprenticed because he can't be raised by her. At a certain point, he's got to go to a man and be raised. Oh, those are difficult things, but they're important. I have my shift on. Boys are wearing shifts until a certain time. This is very important. There is no underwear in the 18th century. You are obviously not children because that's a really big deal. <laughs> when you talk to children that they did not have underwear. I mean, it lasts a whole minute. Because they have to tell, you can't just say the word underwear without telling somebody else the word underwear. Mm -hmm. But this is it for your underwear. You wore the shift because it takes so long to do your clothes. There's no wash machine and dryer. You gotta get the wood, you gotta get the pot. You gotta beat out the dirt. You gotta, you gotta get the live soap. Sometimes you have to make the live soap. When you get the stuff, you gotta put it into the pot. You gotta boil the pot, you gotta boil the water. Unless it's all white and then you gotta use gin and you put gin and water together and you gotta soak it. Then you gotta beat the dirt out a little bit and there's a little thing that you beat something out with and has little holes in it. You beat it, beat it, beat it. And then while you're having the lye, the lye is also made with fat back. So you gotta have somebody um, with uh, fat, bacon fat. And so when somebody's watching the, uh, watching the, the clothes, the bacon will come up to the top and you got to take off the top of that, you know, every now and then so it doesn't get into the clothes. You got to stir it up and then you got to take them out. You got to wring them all up and you got to wring them out. And then if there's more dirt, you got to beat the dirt off some more. You got to put them back in there. Am I with you? Are you with me now? And so, you know, and so this is a long term process. You're wearing this because this is easier to clean and it keeps your other things cleaner. OK, gentlemen, when you get to be men, you're wearing long shirts. And that's what you're wearing. Again, no underwear. So that's important. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have the ladies have a petticoat. And so this is a petticoat, which looks like a skirt, which kids can tell me, which is great. And all women are wearing a petticoat. All women wear petticoats. So it doesn't matter what your station is. Um, uh, and when you're a little boy and you're wearing a shift, you're actually just wearing a big dress too. If you can, they might put a shift on you and then a dress overneath, over top of that if you're out in public. So, um, but, but that's why you're a little boy. And then, but you're wearing petticoats. Petticoats can be working petticoats. They can be uh, just fancy petticoats. The longer the petticoat is, uh, the more likely you are not a working person. 
because if you're working, you don't want that petticoat to be very long, else it will get into the fire or get into your work or your trip. Yeah, it just makes sense. You're like, oh, that just makes sense. Yes, it just makes sense. And we go, oh, they didn't make sense. Yeah, they did. They made perfectly good sense. So, but if you're not working, then you want it long and pretty so that you, don't, you, know, so that you can show it off. They were not our color-coordinated things. They didn't really worry about things matching, which is lovely. So I can wear whatever colors I want. It just freaks out Americans. We go, oh, that just doesn't match. It didn't have to match. Matter of fact, at weddings, it was whatever the color of the year was, of the season, sorry, the color of the season. The color of the season was pink. Everybody wore pink wedding gowns. The color of the season was red, as it was sometimes. Everybody wore red wedding gowns. We would not think of it. Well, nowadays they do some of that. But if it was black, they wore black. And literally, it was whatever the season was, whatever the color was. That's what you wore as the fashionable thing. So you have petticoats. Gentlemen, you are having yourselves breached. You are breached at this point. Um, and so you're wearing your pants. They have flaps in the front, little buttons and flaps in the front. That's important. And then they go about to your knees. This is very important. Come here, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yes, 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 all right. I want you to put one, put, uh, stand on either side, of the, one side or the other. Okay, okay and I want you to put your leg up there. Put your leg up, put, the, yeah, there you go. put your foot up there. Put it up there, good. All right, very good. Now, uh, they can't see you real good. Let me okay. make sure, there we go. We got it. Everybody got to see it. <laughs> now, gentlemen, remember that you are wearing your stockings as well. And the reason that they're wearing stockings is because ladies, we want to find a proper husband. And the way we know a proper husband, please lift up your pants leg. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's from his calf. Uh -huh. If he has a nicely turned calf, then he is a catch. And the reason he's a catch, <laughs> she's, I didn't say put it down oh, yet. I just, <laughs> <laughs> you can put it down. <laughs> but the reason he has a nicely turned calf is either you're, you're, you're able to ride, you have a horse to ride. Not many people have horses to ride, but your calf gets really strong if you have a horse to ride. Or you are gentry and you are taking dance. You are learning the minuet where you are standing on your tiptoes for the minuet. The minuet is how you meet your husband or wife. It is taught, is critically taught. Tutoring, by the time that you're 12 years old, you are doing two to three hours, sometimes a day by the time you get older, of dance. So you know all the dances and the biggest dance is a minuet, which requires you to be on the balls of your feet, which requires you to have good calf muscles. But, sir, if you didn't have good calf muscles, okay. you could go to the store and you could buy stocking stuffers. <laughs> to go in the back of your stocking. <laughs> and the woman wouldn't be all the wiser till you got married. <laughs> Give him a round of applause, he did a good job. <laughs> that is not a lie. You can go to Greenhouse Store in Colonial Williamsburg and buy some stocking stuffers. Mm-hmm. And they thought it was black women that got the fake weave going on. Mm-mm. <laughs> That's a lovely thing. Of course, I love having somebody get up there and do that. And uh, I won't do that with little boys, but when I have bigger boys in the room, I always do that. Then we put on our, um, our top. Now, our top can be one of several things for ladies. It can be a short jacket, which is what this is. And if it's not short, it would be long and it would be called a what? If it's long, it'd be called a what? Long jacket, Lord have mercy, oh my gosh. I called it a short, now I've never had children ever worry about that. They, oh, long jacket. I get with grown folk and they can't even figure out their opposites. It's ridiculous, ridiculous. Y'all were looking for something fancy. It's so funny. I love with adults, because adults are like, they're looking for the meaning and the process. And the child is like, long jacket. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, that's right. <laughs> or you're looking for a gown. A gown is actually not a full length gown. Not like what we see at uh, Disneyland, okay? The gown actually comes to right here, and then it has, it's connected to the rest of the gown that goes down. But the gown is, um, it doesn't have the front part because you want to show off your petticoat. 
Okay, so you can, and then you can lift your gown and put it in all kinds of different ways and stuff. Or you can have hoops underneath your gown if you're going. Um, the hoops were so big in France that the women required both doors to open, and they called them French doors. <laughs> you think I'm making this stuff up? This is good stuff. Women often had fabric shoes. If they went dancing, they had fabric shoes. You ever heard the story of the 12 dancing princes that danced themselves, or seven dance princes, danced themselves out of their shoes? That's what happened. With fabric shoes, you literally would dance until your shoes no longer were able to hold you in. And you always carried an extra set of shoes with you. And you would go to the powder room to go change your shoes. Why is it called the powder room? Because the men wore the wigs. And the wigs would be powdered with different colors so they would sparkle in the candlelight. And they would go back to the powder room to have it repowdered. Yeah, men were pretty intense. By the way, just so you know, men were the first ones to wear high heels. So, <laughs> They can take it back if they want to. I don't mind. As far as I'm concerned. All right, I've already hit my four o'clock. I got to get out the door because y'all got things to do and they're going to kick me out the library. Lord have mercy, darling. Where's my head? Okay. Yes, go ahead, get my head. He's getting good at his job. <laughs> See, he's lucky I had him stand up for this because that way he didn't get called for nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know when to volunteer, or be volunteered, one or the other. Uh, women did have wigs. Um, when women w wore wigs during that time period, this is not why I'm wearing the wig, but the, during that time period, they cut off all their hair and they had bald heads just like the men did. But that wasn't a bad thing to do um, because of lice. <laughs> And um, so getting a bald head was not necessarily a bad thing. Howsomever, you didn't want your, your uh, wig to get too out of place um, and, and too cumbersome. Um, there were wigs that were made of such length and size that birds would nest in them and mice would nest in them. Yeah, that's even worse, by the way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you, you, you just wanted a normal size wig. But there, there's been all kinds of documentation, but it's lovely, lovely, lovely. Now I will introduce you. Those who have already met her, reintroduce you. For those who have not met her, introduce you to Oni Judge. My name is Oni Judge. I was the personal maid servant of Martha Washington. When I was 10 years old, I started working for Mistress Washington. <laughs> I learned how to take care of her every need. I dressed her hair, clothed her, and washed her. I followed her everywhere she went. Sometimes at night, when her feet was cold, she'd tell me to sleep at the end of her bed so my belly could keep her feet warm. I went to the first capital, New York City, with Mistress Washington and seven other slaves. Mistress Washington didn't like that Master Washington become president. <laughs> she liked it even less in New York City. Some of the senators 
had decided to write her schedule for her. You know you wouldn't like that, would you? They tell her she going to have a public reception every Thursday and dinner with visitations on Friday. She was not happy, <laughs> but she complied. When we finally get to Philadelphia, 18 months later, we arrived there with her two grandchildren she took care of, Nellie, be around my age, and Wash, short for Washington. He is trouble. <laughs> I meet so many free Negroes there. They never know about being a slave, they did. Yellow fever come. It run through people around there. Mistress, she, she get told she should take a, um, a vaccination. I think be the word. She didn't want no thing like that. She have us leave town for a while. My brother Austin, he didn't get to leave. He died of the yellow fever. <clears throat> I'm thirsty. Baby, can you get me some water? Oh, Lordy. Oh, I can't open it with my hands, baby. You hold on to that for me, child. Go on back and sit down. They used to call me <clears throat> mistress of the needle. I could sew the smallest, finest stitch. My mama liked the stitching I did. I runs away from the Washingtons when I was 20 and two years of age. Get aboard a ship called Nancy and make my way to New Hampshire. Old folks helped me along the way. There, I had my husband, John Staines. He was a good man. He was a sailing man. He died on the water, sir. As so many do. But before he died, we had three children. William, Eliza, Nancy. You may wonder did the Washingtons try to come and get me? <laughs> they did. But folk in New Hampshire helped me. I stays free. After my John died, it won't too long for my Eliza and Nancy they die. My William, 
They take him away at 10 years of age to be apprentice on a ship. I never see my son again. But I done one thing right. If I had been a slave, my children would have been slaves. My children never knew slavery. They only knew freedom. And freedom, it means everything. I was tired cheering. Good day to you. Good day. So, you have a few moments. Questions about what I've done, how I've done, things that I do, and then I'm gonna end with one last something to say. Questions? She takes a moment, doesn't she? Yes, go ahead. How many different characters do you know? 12 different women in history. Mm -hmm. From the 1600s all the way to the 1960s. Oh, in the 19th century? Uh, in the 19th century. Uh, okay, that would be 1800s. Okay, so not One. Um, probably Mary S. Peake because she's, uh, yeah, because she died young. So, yeah, that would be Mary S. Peake. She's the youngest of them. Most of me try to pick a kind of a window of, in their lives. Good point, that, and that's something I didn't say, so thank you. Um, I do choose a, por a point in their life that I kind of have as a beginning and end. When I look at that, um, that timeline, I can only go to that point and I can't talk beyond it. Now, I'm gonna learn beyond it, but I can't talk behind, beyond it. So I can talk up to everything up to that point. So um, when I, w with her, she can talk about, you know, she got a lot to talk about, okay? Um, th that's not a problem. With Zora Neale Hurston, I can only get up to a certain point in her life, and then the other stuff that happens with her, I can't talk about. Um, and there's a whole chunk of stuff that I can't talk about in her life. Um, and of course, I can't die, so I can't talk about it. Uh, Daisy Bates, Daisy Bates lies in everything she writes. It's like awful. In real life, Daisy Bates lies, okay? And her lies have been proven. But when I present her, I have to tell her the way she would tell her. So I have to tell the lies. I've actually had kids say, you weren't born that year. <laughs> I'm like, I'm certain I know what year I was born. <laughs> Zora Neale Hurston lies. Both those women lie about when they're born. They lie, I mean, and there's, they lie about stuff that they do. And it's just like, you, you have to actually tell it the way they tell it. I can't tell it the way. And then I loved Daisy Bates when I first started her. Then I got to meet some people that actually knew her. <laughs> and she's not one of my favorites anymore, you know? But I have to still present her the way she presented herself. And that's really important. So why, some, go ahead. Why would you choose somebody who's lying? Why would you then perpetuate that lie? Well, I didn't necessarily choose them because they were lying. I, <laughs> after I did the research, I found out they were lying. Me, uh, oh no, I don't, and I don't reject them because their story is still important. Yeah. You know, but I have to tell the story. And then I try to tell afterwards that this, that, that part was not true. And we know that that part is not true. And it's really funny because Zord, Zord gives, I mean, she reduces her age because she wants to go to school. And she can't go to school unless she's a certain age. So she just, just gives herself a different age, a different birth, different birthplace. <laughs> Whole bit. Totally unproven. I mean, just totally proven wrong. They're like, oh my gosh, you lied about everything. Yeah, she did. But she had a reason for lying about it. I mean, there was a reason. She, she let me out. And, then, and she may, she's not going to say that. Because she's not going to say, I lied about this, okay? But after the story, after the end, you, you need to, I have to tell people, there's a reason she did this. And it was a very good reason. Because she would not have been able to go to school and get the things that she needed. And she wouldn't have been able to go to college. And wouldn't have of meals and men. Yes? Uh, with Madam C.J. Walker, so how do you tell a 
the story about how she got the idea for her wonderful hair growth. Okay, so here's the deal. She may have stole the, the idea from another person, okay? <laughs> she may. Annie Pope Turnbull. But anyhow, um, because she sold the woman's products, but then she went to Colorado, and then she had her own products, and she was a much better marketer, <laughs> bottom line. And her husband didn't get, get to be a fool until later. Annie Pope Turnbull's husband took all the money. Yeah, it doesn't help. But here's the deal. She never explains that. As a matter of fact, she never tells anybody how she got the idea. She gives three different advertisements about how she got the idea. And so what I say is, if you want to believe that I was asleep at night and an African man came to me in a dream and showed me all the products to put together that were natural so I could make these products, if that will help you buy my project, you may believe that. <laughs> and, then, and I do that with all three things because she advertised three different ways. So I just do what she did. She just showed, if that's the reason you can't, you, oh, I, I, I love the fact that you had an African man tell you this. Oh, yes. <laughs> she didn't deny it. She just, I mean, she didn't deny that she, it, it, she's, I love her, but she's, um, and, and she worked herself till she died. She's younger than me when she dies. <clears throat> but she works herself till she dies. Oh, her marketing was phenomenal. She's pre-Mary Kay. If, and I was a Mary Kay consultant when I was learning Madam C.J. Walker. And all I would do, I was looking at Mary Kay and looking at Madam C.J. Walker. Oh my gosh, it is the same plan. And I mean the same plan. I think, my personal opinion, I think that Mary Kay met a Walker woman down in Texas. Uh huh. No, she didn't meet Ann Pope Turner. She was done. But she met a Walker woman. Now, Madam C.J. Walker did, you know. Yeah, she. Yeah, yeah. The plan was a long plan. Yeah, they, well, Annie Pope Turnbull just didn't, she didn't have the money to continue. She just didn't do it. And so, but I think that's how they got, but that's a whole other story. Okay, last but not least. Okay, yes. Yeah. What do, you, what do you do when um, somebody asks you a question that you should know the answer for, but you don't know the answer for? Oh, I am so good at that. I am so good at that. Number one thing I do is, oh, I am so, I'm so tired. I can barely think right now. I know I should know that, but it has been such a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> I get old. I cough. I, I you know... There have been times I've lied, and then I knew I was going to have time to tell them that was a lie. I have, I've done that sometimes, depending on how much I really should know. Like, if it's something that I know I know, but the word is not there, and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. The name of the man is Captain, 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 Captain Jim Bean. That's what I say, you know? And <laughs> when I'm done, I'll go back and I say, that was not his real name. I could not think of it, but I knew I needed to know it. And then, you know, and then usually it comes to me by that time. But I, I have done a bunch of, I've, you know, oh, I'm just tired. I don't know that one. Well, I, what do you mean you don't understand that one? You didn't get, you don't know the answer to that? <laughs> and I'll go on. <laughs> I'm serious. I have done it all. I mean, because in character, in character, you can say things you cannot say when you are yourself. In character, when a child is acting a fool, Oh, on a judge and whoever else I am can do a number. Oh, Bess, my first one, old Bess from the Civil War, I mean, Revolutionary War time period. She's like, boy, have you lost your common sense? I do believe you have. Because you had any common sense, you'd understand that a fool is known for its silence. And even in silence can be wise. <laughs> and that boy... And the other kids are going, I think she called you a fool. I think she called you a fool. I think she called you a fool, man. And they don't know what to do about all that. Because they're like, oh, okay, well, then I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that. Because they're not used to that. I, can say, I have teachers that just love me. They're just like, we just, we just, and, we, we, and they like to put the hard ones right there in front of me. So, yeah. And I'm like, you just put the hard ones in. Yeah. Because we know you're going to say the things we've been wanting to say. <laughs> And I do, and in character camp. So, how many of y'all go to a church? Don't have to raise your hands. How many of y'all have joined a club? 
How many of y'all have a grandchild or a child that you're connected with in the life that goes to a school? Our churches need to have their histories remembered. It's a great place to do a historic character presentation of someone from your church's history, someone from the past, about the difficulty to build a building or raise the money. A part of your, child, your homecoming can be that person coming in. If you have a grandchild or a child that goes to a school, help your teacher, help their teacher. Be a person in history. You don't have to have fancy things or do so much research you're just out of control. Just enough to add to what they're doing. They will appreciate it and you will have so much fun. Find the places where you can present history in a fun way. I don't always present history in my costume. Sometimes I tell the story, but I make the story come alive because I've done the research and I tell what sticks out to me so people want to listen to it. If nothing else, tell the story. Tell the stories. Our children are dying for people to talk to them. They have all the social media they can handle. And yet, the number one age of people committing suicide right now is middle school, middle school age children. They are dying for somebody to talk with them. And part of that way can be through history. Children that know their history find that because they have soldiers, shoulders that they have, can stand on, and also know that they're gonna be the next shoulders, tend to want to do better and make better decisions because they have the stories of ancestors behind them. Share stories. And for those of you who do already, thank you. Continue on, be encouraged. And for those who haven't started yet, I look forward to hearing about it. And if you ever want some help, that doesn't cost you a dime from me. Just time. Thank you so much. Thank you.